I got to admit, I love this movie growing up as a kid, and I am just absolutely addicted to Cobra Kai. The first three seasons have been off the charts. I binge-watched maybe season three in about, I don't know, two days, three days, give or take. And I am fired up that we have Marty Cove, who is playing the legend, John Kreese, and he's bringing him back, and he's kicking ass, and he's one of the all-time badasses, and he's nice enough to give us a couple minutes. Marty, it's John Zestremski. Appreciate the time, man, and congratulations. How you doing? Thank you. Thank you, Real. Yeah, it's a real gas to do this show, and it's really fun to bring back all those, you know, those values from 84, but plus, you know, the guy is a little more, I would say a little more multifaceted now than he was back then. You know, back then I think the movies were white hats and black hats. And uh, now, you know, the characters have to be more multifaceted because I think audiences are far more sophisticated 35 years later than they were back when you and I saw the movies, you know? Oh, Marty, no doubt. And, you know, I think about the concept of this show. And I love the movie. And when I first heard about Cobra Kai and Johnny Lawrence and Daniel Russo and, you know, all of the storylines of the Karate Kid, I was wondering, how are they going to pull off a spinoff? And I think you hit on something that was very important. I think it's been amazing to kind of see the shift. Like, you know the deal. As great as your character was, as great as Johnny's character was, you guys were the bad guys when that movie came out. Now, when you watch the show, I find myself all in on Cobra Kai. I find myself all in on Johnny Lawrence. Do you think that kind of speaks to the brilliance of what you guys have been able to do in these first three years? Well, I think it speaks to the brilliance of these writers. You know, when we all met and um, we, we chatted, and they were very persuasive because they knew so much about the characters, and they had great plans. You know, they had those, you know, those flashback plans. I mean, I talked about that ages ago because I wanted a more multifaceted character, and I wanted him to be vulnerable, and I wanted him to maybe have a woman, you know, and they were on those lines two years ago, three years ago. You know, and they said, you're going to arrive and everybody's going to go crazy and you're going to set up season two. And I said, well, why can't I come in in episode six instead of coming in episode 10 of season one? And they said, trust me, trust us. It'll make a big uh, hoopla. And bottom line, it did. So it's their perception. It's their intelligence. And these characters really write so well that everything is gray. There's nothing, there's no white hats or black hats in this game. And, you know, the kids identify with the kids on the show, kids in in society identify with the kids in the show, and then they go back and watch the movies because most 16-year-olds haven't seen the picture, you know? It's crazy to think about. Now, for you specifically, Marty, what was your reaction when you were approached to do this project? I mean, I'm just thinking about it as somebody who's a fan of the movies, and, you know, seeing the success you had, when you get initial word that they're bringing back the character of John Kreese, what was your initial reaction? Well, I wanted people to know about what, why the guy was such a hard ass. And that was the most important thing for me. So, I, you know, I chatted with mercenaries and I chatted with um, army rangers and I just got a real sense of that character and where he came from. But I didn't go far far back like they do in the flashback. They go back to 1965. And my son plays that bully who, you know, bullies the guy. You you think this tall, good-looking guy is is John Kreese. Oh, I thought it was Kreese, 100%, Marty. As I'm watching that live, you know, they're setting up that flashback scene. I thought it was 100% your character. And that was brilliant how they pulled that off because it kind of like introduced the audience, right, to this is how John Kreese became no mercy, sweep the leg, Cobra Kai, John Kreese. Yeah, and and I wanted to, I wanted those colors to be assumed by the writing. In other words, you asked me why would I go into it? If they were going to do that, I was interested. You know, uh, I wasn't interested in playing just a badass. It wasn't, it wasn't important to me. 
So three years ago, you know, I, I said, what are your plans? And they told me their plans. And in the last three years, you've seen their orchestration of an interesting character. And he's become, God knows he's become, he's been reinvented uh, as an icon. And I never use that word for, per se, because to me, an icon is Anthony Hopkins, Jack Nicholson, Sean Connery. You know, I don't know if Martin Cove or John Kreese is an icon. But people throw that word around a lot. But they've done it. They've made this guy so interesting, you know, even though he's an, an ass, they, they made him interesting. And I think of him as misunderstood rather than just a villain, you know, and they've kept it that way. And that's why we all, you know, joined up to play. And, you know, they, they just were able to deliver. And plenty of other scripts come your way. You know, people come to you and they say, well, we're going to do a buddy movie and we're going to do like a combination of Butch Cassidy and the Karate Kid. Well, you read the script nine out of ten times, it's garbage. So these cats delivered, you know, they just delivered. We got Marty Cove. He's the iconic. I'm going to say it. That's okay. John Kreese, Karate <laughs> Kid, Cobra Kai. Listen, it's near and dear in my heart, Marty. I'm going to roll with it, bro. As someone who, you know, spent time with Ralph Macchio and Billy Zapka. Way back when, when you guys filmed in the mid '80s, similar, different, somewhere in between, seeing them evolve as characters, people, all that time. The one that's got to be a real cool experience, huh? Well, you know, Billy has evolved so strongly as an actor. You know, uh, uh, he was he was good in those days. He was he was good, but the character was so different. He wasn't he wasn't as developed. He wasn't as irreverent. You know, he wasn't as belligerent, you know. Now Billy is just, his character has become, you know, he's become so fascinating. And he's got a great sense of humor as the character. You know, you saw him eating the pine nuts in the car, you know. And he doesn't even know, he doesn't even know that you can talk to Amanda in the, in the car speaker without leaning over to the, to the wheel, you know. And then he he just says, you know, we're t- you know we're 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 not tango and cash. They were they were drug cops. We're we're, we're you know regular policemen. I mean, he's so out of touch with the things in society, which allows you to just crack up hysterically, you know. And uh, so the work itself is much more versatile, much more difficult. And he does a great job with all this. Back in those days, he was just a, a bully who hated Ralph and picking his girl. Here, you know, they write the stuff, and you got to act it. You know, my character loves loves Billy. It's his favorite. He's his favorite person in the world, and the only thing he loves more than than Johnny Lawrence is Cobra Kai. He will not may he will not you know dissipate any of the integrity of Cobra Kai. And if Billy dissipates the integrity of Cobra Kai, you see what happened in season two. I took over the dojo because nobody is going to destroy Cobra Kai, despite how much I love Johnny Lawrence. Even he's not going to do it. You well, know? Marty, I loved the plot twist at the end of season three and what you guys were able to do with Johnny's son. I mean, to me, it's just, it's brilliant stuff. It's like these heel turns. You know, we saw it with your character at the end of season two. You mentioned that love of Cobra Kai. And then it's season three. To see it all come full circle where Billy's son basically goes from Ralph Macchio and the Miyagi-Do karate, and now you're taking him out of juvie, bringing him into Cobra Kai, and you have this great showdown at the end of season three. That must have been awesome reading that in the script. I know as an actor, that would fire the hell out of me, man. So what were you thinking as you're like reading this, as you're going through playing this character and seeing where it's going with the Johnny Lawrence son plot twist. Well, to be perfectly honest, the, the fighting is what was really, I focused on. Oh, the and that fighting. fight scene was awesome, Marty. Marty, that was yeah. awesome, dude. I oh, love thank it. You, thank you. That was a hairy fight scene. I mean, we, those stunt guys were just brilliant. And anytime we use, you know, uh, hero, um, he and his wife are just brilliant. And um, my stunt guy, Ken, and Hiro, and, and, and his wife, 
They just mount these stunts so well. So we worked on that fight scene all the way through the year because we knew we'd be doing it at the end. And that's how we did even with the fight I had with Billy in, you know, episode uh, one, season two. We fight the important fights. We, we play with them and practice them and rehearse them all the way through the season. And then we do them at the end. So it's basically out of, out of context, but it doesn't matter because you're getting really good physically. So I was concerned about that. The, the, the amazing thing, like you just said, is that everybody couldn't believe that he comes in at the end and just discs his father and tells Ralph where to go. And, you know, it, it, the character, my character was so conspiratorial that they just drop in. And when I visit him in juvie and I just go and I tell him the story of his dad and he rejects me. But I know I'll get it. I know you know, I can turn his head. And sure enough, it happens because of the writing. The writing is so good. And these, you know, these characters, the kids are all wonderful actors. They really are. And they're wonderful athletes. They really, that fight scene in the, in the school, the fight scene in the house, these kids are great. You know, I used to value myself in all these white line fever and all these crazy movies I did in the 70s and 80s fighting and all that, but these kids, they're all so young and they fight so well, you know, and they don't get a lot of time to perfect that fighting. So what he did and fight with Billy and all that, it was just terrific. Just terrific. And then flying through the window, the stunt guys did a great job. And they did it twice. And, um, you know, the first time the glass didn't fall properly, so they had to do it again. And it's just, you know, it hurts me because I'm walking barefoot on the glass, you know, but I didn't have to go through the window like they did. Well, but listen, it, that's so why you're the like, ultimate badass. That's why, you know, they can, they can always look at Marty Cove and know that they got a pro's pro in one of those fight scenes. And you mentioned the chemistry you have with a bunch of the kid actors. They're phenomenal. I mean, the Miguel character is great. The Tory character is great. The evolution of Hawk is great. Marty, do you have one, like, with a chem- from a chemistry standpoint where it's like, wow, it clicks? Because obviously you have that with Billy from all those years of going back to the movie. Uh, but is there a chemistry that you feel, you know, instantly with one of these kid actors, give or take? Well, I, I actually felt it with Hawk. You know, I felt it very strong with Hawk. And then as Tori's character evolved, because obviously my mother committed suicide and was very sick. And, you know, I have a similarity with her when I go to see, I mean, how'd you like that scene where I take the cigar, the cigar cutter and cut this guy? Oh, amazing. Absolutely amazing. And that's what you hit on with the evolution of your character. I think the scenes with Tori going back to Vietnam, it humanizes John Kreese, it really does. You're, you're so right about that. I think it was, it was so important to show this season and hopefully what's to come. Because, like, you're watching that scene as she's getting bullied by that punk, that jerk who's running the housing complex and whatnot. And it's like, this guy got it coming. You know, Kreese is going to go and kick, kick his ass, give or take. I thought that was so cool to see. Those were two of my favorite scenes, I think, in the entire season. I really do. How about, how about, how about that cut? when I got the thing on his finger and then they cut to the hot dog being sliced. Yeah. Eerie, right scary, after? and badass. All kind of combined into one, if you ask me, Marty. I mean, that, was, that was a great edit where all of a sudden I got the cutter around his finger and he's screaming and then we cut to a hot dog being sliced. I mean, it's just hysterical. But that's the kind of writing these guys do. They literally write that stuff and they think of this. And we have a great staff of writers, too. You know, they've got a just terrific writer's room. And, you know, they have a lot of, you know, guys who write well for them. But it's all about the writing. I mean, shows like Newsroom, you know, when you have Aaron Sarkin writing it, guys like, like you know, Jeff Daniels, it's just a pleasure to read the words, you know? It's just it's a pleasure, you know? And, and, and it's quite different than when you have the times I struggled in the past with, you know, we had great writers in Tagging and Lacey too, so it was easy to do the words. But if you don't have really good writers, it's not as, it's not as fluid for the actor, emotionally or physically. 
to, you know, to sort of make the moment work. You know, it's just, it's more work than it would be pleasure. And um, I find it's so easy. I don't try to change their line, you know. I, I, I just enjoy, and, and there's a sense of darkness with these three guys. You know, they like, <laughs> they like, especially I think Hayden, Hayden Schlossberg, he likes the little darkness of John Kreese, you know, so he always puts a little salt and pepper on that, you know. I oh, got to butter it up, of course. Now, how much of a thrill was it for all you guys and gals to have Elizabeth Shue back on set and, and doing the end of season three? I mean, she was awesome. Marty, I mean, her scenes with with Billy, her scenes with Ralph, I, I mean, you could only feel like this sort of like pull to one character and another. And it almost had me thinking that, you know, if we could go back in time, Maybe uh, Allie Mills was destined to be with Johnny Lawrence and not with Daniel LaRusso. Just saying. Well, you know, may- maybe. It's kind of hard. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't on the set those days. I looked at all the scenes. And I I, I think that, you know, it's, God, you know, I haven't, I, I long to find this girl that I, in summer camp, Camp Toledo. Her name was, at that time, I think her name was uh, Andrea Mantel. And Andrea Mantel was a love of mine from, from Camp Toledo when I was 12 and 13, 14. And I would love to have the feeling, because I've had a couple of girlfriends come back into my life, and I didn't have that draw that Billy had with Lisa. I mean, it didn't happen for me on the screen. He, he, I mean, it didn't happen for me in real life. On the screen, I wish I could have felt that about these other girls that fell into my life over the last 25 years. But there's one girl that I I know I would have a feeling for, like Billy had for Lisa. And I kind of am jealous because I've never had that with the other old girlfriend. And I long to have that as an actor, feel what that feels like, you know? It's, it's very exciting, I think, you know? And I wasn't there when they shot that stuff, but... I wonder if I would have gotten a little taste of that literally on the set. You know, it, it would have been interesting because old girlfriends, when you were a teenager and you see them 40 years later, most of the time you look at them and, uh, uh, you know, they're not anything like they were when they were 12, 13, and 14. Uh, but, you know, you still would like emotionally to drop into that and see what it feels like, especially as an actor, you know? We got more so, to go. John Kreese, Cobra Kai, Karate Kid. Uh, Morty, did you guys film season three before, during, or after COVID? Before. It was before. Oh, so, so you guys didn't have to deal with the challenges of, you know, uh, testing, this, that. So you guys had that basically all filmed before, you know, season three was released. That makes sense. Yeah, exactly. We, we were finished shooting um, in December. And uh, then we were off for a couple of months, and then you know COVID happened. But to be you know perfectly honest, um, you know it, it was a blessing because it was a very it was a long season. You know it was longer than the every year. Every season we have is more ambitious than the year before, and we're all you know we're all excited, and no one's you know no one loses their excitement about this show. I think that's what's so fascinating. That you know, no one loses their enthusiasm to do this piece because society and civilization loves the basis. Oh, we want more, Marty. I'll be honest with you. I finished up season three, and I'm like, can I have ten more episodes to watch? I was like bummed when it was over. (laughs) As great as it was, and and it was an epic finish, by the way. The payoff on the final three episodes was amazing. But I'm almost sitting there watching. I'm like, damn, this is over. I want to watch more. Yeah, and, and you know, it's it's kind of, it's too bad we can't make it, like, right away, because everybody wants it. And then you could, you know, you could do two seasons. Like, ages ago, they made 39 episodes of television. And, you know, they would shoot from, God knows, let's see. They would shoot from around, I think, July, all the way through, or August, all the way through for six months, and do 39 episodes. So, <laughs> so you get a whole sense of being the character. You get a whole sense of publicity going on. You're almost like eight months of the year. You're like, you're in it. 
You know, you're in the character, you're in the set, you're, you know, you can talk about it, you can do publicity about it, and it's great. And then, boom, then it airs for three months. So you have a year of a show, you know, a year as an actor or as an audience member, you have a year and you have, you know, repeats. Now it's a little different. Now it's a little different, you know. It's harder to stay with it unless you keep binging and binging and binging, you know, and you watch it three times a year. <laughs> uh, how big was it for you guys as a show, as a cast, uh, to get the Netflix blessing? I mean, for me, listen, I found it on YouTube Premium. It's amazing, Marty. I didn't have YouTube Premium. I'd subscribe for like two or three months, watch the show, and then I would cancel it and then renew whenever you guys came back. But everybody's got Netflix. Everybody's dialed in. And you guys are like the number one show at a time in which everybody's at home. We got nothing to do. I mean, that had to be a major, major boom for all you guys. Yeah, it definitely did. I mean, number one, everybody's at home. But number two, it was we're all looking to feel better. We're all looking to feel better because there's a lot of situations we cannot control political situations, medical situations, you know, economic situations. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we can't control right now out there. We want to feel good. So nostalgia is what makes us feel good. And you remember how you felt seeing this movie and seeing these characters back in the 80s. So the adults, not so much the kids, but the adults truly remember how they felt seeing this terrific movie, Karate Kid 1, 2, and 3. And so it gave us the edge. But the fact that these, these characters are written so well and written to basically to the, for the kids today. And they're gray. The characters are gray. No one's good. No one's bad. And it's just like life. It's just like life, you know? And uh, I think that was a really big coup for all of us being home, being nostalgic and having it be really terrific writing. Marty Cove. Marty, it's been awesome. I'm not going to ask for any season four spoilers because, listen, that's just the way it goes. We're going to watch it unfold when it's on Netflix and all that good stuff. But you know how many people would love to take uh, a tour and would love to maybe get in the ring at that All-Valley tournament set up? Like, having that back in season one and hopefully maybe having it in season four would be incredible. But I got to ask you this question. Because I love both lines. When we are playing high school baseball, it was no mercy, sweep the leg. I mean, we were quoting your character. We loved it. We ate it up. What line do you enjoy more, no mercy or sweep the leg? Well, you know, I use them both when I do these little cameos. You know, these little people say, you know, they send you in a request to say happy birthday to John. And then I always end up saying, usually, it's like, you know, have a great birthday. Mercy is for the week here and on the streets. Somebody confronts you. He is the enemy, even during your birthday. An enemy deserves no mercy. So have a great birthday. And I take a long pause. And I say, and remember, sweep the leg. So I think sweep the leg is, you know, it's like such a tough ass. No mercy is used. No Mercy, I think, came, that's been around for a while. Never used in a karate movie, but but that's been around for a while. It's like, it, it's like you know, I, they even used it in the Alamo, because I'm a big Western guy. And and they used it in the Alamo, you know, no quarter, they called it, when they blew the Teguelo, which means no quarter, no mercy. Kill all the Texans. You know, that was what Santa Ana blew. So the concept of no mercy has been around, but sweep the leg means the same as no mercy. It means it's a dark definition because it's illegal, you know, and you don't want to hurt somebody by sweeping the leg. So it means a lot of things to a lot of people. <laughs> you can use it in a business meeting. You know, you can use it anywhere. No mercy means be tough and be hard and all that. But if you look at somebody and you say, sweep the leg. And he's, he's going back to a negotiation with another lawyer. He's got to think about what that means. You know, he's already into the no mercy. He's already into winning, but sweep to lay. That means use everything you have, but you'd be triumphant or just stay out of the room. <laughs> you know? I love it. 
I love it. I feel like I want to run through a brick wall right now. And I could see why you're used as somebody who's going to, like, motivate people. Uh, Marty, are you a big sports guy or not really? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I played soccer. I was, you know, I, I lived in New York, you know, from Brooklyn. And, I, and I, I'm I, living in Brooklyn right now. Where, where are the whereabouts in Brooklyn? Oh, I was in Crown Heights. I, I know it. Heights. I know it. Very and, nice. We're in the well, Brooklyn Heights Cobble Hill area, by the way, Marty, in case you're wondering. Yeah, I, I know. I, I know it because I, I was there with my girlfriend, and you know, we that River Cafe is a lovely place. I like that place. You know, right, right by the water, and um, but in, in general, you know, that that's a beautiful part. Of, you know, beautiful part of Brooklyn. Um, you know, and and I I often you know I I often I often go back. I I I, I take my kids there. You know, and I I, I look at the neighborhood and my. Everything looks kind of small now. PS 161, which was on Crown Street in Crown Heights, and then Lefferts Junior High School, which was on Empire Boulevard. And, you know, and then I moved to Queens. And so uh, I think it was my bar mitzvah, I moved to Queens and went to high school there. So it's kind of, you know, I still go back. It's wonderful heritage. And, you know, there's nothing like a Nathan's hot dog, man. I ain't kidding. Are you a Yankee fan or a Mets fan, Marty? Well, I wasn't either one. I was a Dodger fan. Okay. When the, Do- when the Dodgers moved out, I, in 1958, and I told this story. You'll love this story. I told this story on Johnny Carson in 1985, I think, when First Karate Kid first came out. We were like 11, and we, this kid named Tommy Chiodo and I, we broke into Ebbets Field. We climbed up. I don't know how we got it, but we climbed up, and we resented the Dodgers leaving. We were big Dodger fans, and we ran around the field. And then I pulled this—I don't know what I pulled. I pulled this this alarm, and all of a sudden, from right field, the door opened up, the garage door opened up, and there's a guy with a Doberman Pinscher. And we're two eleven-year-olds screaming and yelling and crying. We thought this dog was going to go for our throats. We ran across the field, ran onto Bedford Avenue, threw open this this big, you know, metal. A rod and jumped out, and oddly enough, oddly enough, um, two days later, Tommy Chiodo called me. After not seeing this kid for 25 years in Brooklyn, he called me and says, "I'm a stockbroker in Rochester. If you ever need information, give me a call. I watched you on Johnny Carson the day before yesterday, and he wrote me a letter." That is incredible. Me. That is absolutely incredible, and. This is in an age when you didn't have cell phones or, you know, Instagram or Facebook or any of that stuff. So to get that letter, Marty, I mean, that's badass right there. Final one, and I appreciate the time. New Yorker through and through. What was the victory cigar of choice? I love the Instagram, Marty. The cigars. I saw Havana. I mean, I was very jealous. I was living vicariously through you. What was the victory (laughs) cigar of choice when you finished up the show? Give me a second. I got to really think about this one. The victory cigar in general, for me, is is basically a Particus, it's a red label Particus Havana, Particus Four, and and then there's another one. I went to I went to um, I went to Havana in January, and I took my son, and it was fascinating. And we were exposed to a Romeo and Julieta. Wide Churchill, and this was—I never had this before. And you know, we took the tour of the Particus factory, and downstairs they gave me the cigar, and it was brilliant. So, in essence, the greatest cigar for me is always the Particus, the red label Particus Four, and it's a robusto size. And this other is a robusto size, but it's really just incredible as well. It's called the Wide Churchill, made by Romeo and Julieta. So, depending on what's available. That's what I will have. But I do have a cigar. It's like, even if you're not supposed to smoke and, you know, uh, you know, I, I try not to smoke every day. But what happens is I feel really good about the day's work. If I go, if I, you know, had a rough day and was, I've got the lines down and it doesn't matter what set it is. But I find it's a reward. It's like some people eat ice cream. I just love having a cigar, you know, and I'll, I'll do it four hours before I go to bed. I mean, I, if, 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 if I, you know, the circumstances where I can't really have a cigar in the van or something, but 
It's a reward, I think. It's a luxurious reward for people. Having a cigar is noble. I think it's elegant. I think, you know, it's much better than cigarettes. And it really makes you feel, for some reason, when you smoke a good cigar, that you've accomplished something today. I love the sound of that. And, Morty, listen, next time you're in New York, uh, I think we got to find a spot maybe to have a cigar, maybe a scotch, and away we go. Bro, continued success. I love what you're doing, man. Keep it up. The show is great. Cobra Kai on Netflix. The legend, Marty Cove, kicking ass, playing John Kreese. Appreciate it, Marty. Great. Thank you so much for the time, all right? Great talking to you, man. Fun talking to someone who loves what I love. It's great. There we go. Brooklyn, right. cigars, Cobra Kai. 